We're going to now turn to Colossians. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you have your outlines, the programs, there's fill in the blanks there. We're going to jump into the book of Colossians. We've been going verse by verse, just looking at what Paul wrote to the church in Colossae and just saying, hey, here's how you're supposed to live as Christians. Here's how you're supposed to live as Christ followers. And so Colossians verses 14 and 15 are two verses we're going to look at for the rest of my time I have this morning. In verse 14, it says, and over all these virtues put on what? Love. It says, over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Verse 15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. It's a calling to saying, you know what, Christ followers, Christians, people with the Holy Spirit inside of you, the one thing that you need to do above all else is put on love is put on love. We're going to talk a little bit about what that looks like and what it means for you to do that. And then verse 15 steps into the idea of peace. And we're going to talk about what the word peace means and and what it looks like to have peace in that way. But I want to back up and just hit you with this quick thought before we start rolling. What authority does the Bible have in your life? What authority, right? We live in a country where people don't like authority very much. (laughs) We don't like to be told what to do. We don't like to be told what we can't do. We don't like to be told where we have to go and what we do. Like, we just don't like authority. It might be part of the American revolution that's been bred into all of us, right? We grew up in the land of the home of the... All right, we're going, we're doing, you guys are with me, right? We're like, I don't want to be told. I don't want to have a king, the king of England, right? We don't want to have a king over us. We want to be free. We want to be free to take our destiny into our own hands. And so there's a pause when the Bible talks about authority. Sometimes within us, there's this nature of like, I don't really like to be told what to do. I don't really like to be corrected, to be taught, to be trained up. And that's actually what the Word of God is all about. And so people who say the Bible has authority to speak to me, you have chosen to submit yourself to the Word of God. And this is what the Word of God says about why we have it and what we're supposed to do with it. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training up in righteousness. The idea is the Bible, as we submit to it, the Bible speaks to us to to teach us, to give us instruction, right? It, It teaches us. It rebukes and corrects. Those are hard words to have. Those are hard conversations. Sometimes the Bible reads our heart and says, you're in the wrong place doing the wrong thing, and you're going to hurt because of it. And the Bible wants to correct us, to train us up in righteousness, to help us choose the right path to walk down. So, so how did we get the Bible? How, how did, what does the Bible say about how we got it? In 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, it says, Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture came from the prophet's own understanding. Can I just pause there? They didn't just choose to write what they wanted to write. They, they didn't just sit down and think, I'm going to write a couple chapters of the Bible today. That's what I'm going to do on my schedule. So I'm just going to come up with some good stuff to say. It wasn't their own understanding. Verse 21, it says, or it didn't come from their own human initiative. It says, no, those prophets were moved by who? The Holy Spirit. And they spoke from who? God. So somehow as the Bible was coming through people, the spirit of God in people, God would move through his spirit, move through the people to bring them to write what God wanted them to write, to bring them to communicate what he knew his church needed to hear. It was about God through his spirit. The Bible is God breathed. It's, it's, it's coming from him, right? He's speaking it to us and they were writing down what the spirit was moving them to write. That the Greek word for move is tied to the picture of a, sh- of a ship being pushed by the winds, right? You know, back before they had engines on boats, how did they move? They hoisted the, and they waited for the wind to blow. And when the wind blew, that's when the ship moved. The Holy Spirit would move, right? And it's that picture of the Holy Spirit moving people to write what God wanted them to write. Finally, you look at the Bible and you say, how does the Bible speak to me? How does the Bible speak to me? There's times when I read it and it's just like, man, it is just hitting me between the eyes with a two by four, right? It is just hitting me between the eyes with a two by four. And here's what the author of Hebrews said. It says, for the word of God is what? Alive. That book you're holding, it's alive. The word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than its sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit, between joint and marrow, and it exposes even our innermost thoughts and desires. You know, God's word, as we read it, it reads us. Can I say that again? 
As we read it, it reads us. It can separate our thoughts, our desires. It can point out and convict and challenge. It can call us to action. It can say, here, this is what you're supposed to do. This is what God is communicating to his word. Verse 13 says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. When you submit yourself to the Word of God and you say, okay, I believe the Bible is inspired by the Word of God. I believe that the Bible is inerrant, that we we have the truth that God wants to communicate to us, and I'm going to submit my life to it. It's going to teach, correct, rebuke, train up, to prepare us. It's going to be from God through people to us so that we can see our own hearts clearly. And and the reality is we're all going to give an account to God, whether we obey, obey the Bible or we don't obey the Bible. But it's the word of God that's being put in front of us and the Holy Spirit in us drawing us to obey and believe and trust and to live out. So the word of God is what God has given us. And because we have the word of God, here's the next thing on your fill in the blank. The charge of Thrive Church is to present everyone fully mature. The the charge of Thrive Church, if you're coming to Thrive Church, this is your church home. Our church's goal, according to the Bible, is to present you as fully mature. All right, what's the opposite of being fully mature? mature. Completely immature. How many of you guys have somebody in your home who is completely, no, don't raise your hands, right? (laughs) Right? I worked with middle schoolers for eight years, completely immature, right? You just, you walk beside them and you live with them and they say crazy things, right? Some boys, they grow older, but they don't ever grow up, right? That's just the reality. And so it's possible that you can be a Christian, but you've never matured in your Christian walk. You've never matured. You've never grown in your Christian walk. You're still that like spiritual infant. And, and, and it talks about that. Somebody who drinks milk from a bottle like a baby. It's like, listen, you're 20 years old. Isn't it time to learn to feed yourself? Isn't it time to grow? And that's what the word of God gives us to do. And so when Paul is writing to the church and he says, hey, over all these virtues put on love, that's what mature people do. Grown up Christians put on love. It binds them all together. The picture of a belt, right? They would have worn tunics. Anybody ever wear a bathrobe in a church play? Anybody? Come on now. Raise your hand. Stacy. thank you. Thank you, right? You, you, put, you put the tunic, the belt, you put the belt around it, and you pulled it tight like a bathrobe. Love is that, that virtue that is added to everything. Mature Christians understand the importance of love. Mature Christians understand the importance of love. It says this. Listen, if you want to have more compassion, add love to your compassion. If you want to have more kindness, add love to your kindness. If you want to have more humility, add love to your humility. If you want to be more gentle, add love to your gentleness. If you want to be more patient, add love to your patience. You see, mature Christians understand that love gets the job done. Love gets the job done. When you work with people, when you go through tough things and you're in a trying situation, you say, all right, I need to put on love because love is what brings the unity together. Love is what what causes us to grow forward. If I don't feel love in a relationship with somebody, there's something wrong in that relationship. Here's Paul's charge in in Colossians. Again, I'm reading the context of the passage to you, then we're going to pull out what he says. Colossians 1.25, he says, I have become become the servant by the commission that God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden until the ages of this generation, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's kind of saying this this whole Bible thing that that God's letting me write and lead and direct, it's being made known, I'm writing it, he's communicating it, and and I want to make Christ known in you, right? I want to make Christ known in you. In you. And it goes on, verse 28 says, He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so we may present everyone what? Fully mature in Christ. See, you can't all do everything at once. Like, it doesn't work. Do you ever have a list, like a honeydew list? Anybody get honeydew lists from your wives? Like, here's what we're going to do. Here's what, like, my, my wife and I, we made a list for this weekend, what we were going to do with our time. You know how many things I got done on the list? Zero, because this came up, that came up, and then this needed done. And it's like, I didn't do very good in my honeydew list. But, but what it's saying is like, listen, we need to be fully mature in Christ. We need to be, and there's this list of growing. I can't do everything at once, but I can do one thing at one time and take one step. So in your process with Christ, if you can take one thing at one time and take one step, you're growing. You're growing. And at Thrive Church, we want everyone to take their next step in their relationship with God. We want to help walk beside you because you might not be fully mature yet, but we want you to be growing. 
You you might be struggling with some areas in your life, but we want you to be growing. We want you to be more obedient. We want you to take that step. Paul's saying, listen, this is my call. I want to present everyone fully mature. At Thrive Church, our leadership wants to help you grow so that you can say, I am growing in my relationship with Christ. And man, at some point, I hope I can say that I am mature in my walk with Christ. I've seen God grow me and give me wisdom and patience and truth. And I've seen God change me from the way I used to be to the way I am now. And in verse 29, Paul says, to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. So listen, in the growing process of presenting believers fully mature, submitting to the word of God, this this fullness of God's word that we have, submitting to that, it it changes us. It speaks to us. It challenges. We we stand before the Bible and, and the word of God, the Holy Spirit reads us and shows us what changes we need to do and how we need to grow and what step is next. Love makes everything better, right? Love makes everything better. That's the summary of verse 14. Here we go at 15. Peace is having a harmonious relationship with God and fellow believers. Verse 15 says this. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your what? Your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. The idea that the body of Christ is like, hey, we need everybody to do their part, right? And in 1 Corinthians, it talks about there's an elbow, right? There's a shoulder, there's a nose, there's an eyes, there's ears. We can't all have the same purpose or the same point. But together, the body of Christ is a whole bunch of people coming together as one for the mission and the purpose and saying, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Now, I had to look up that word peace. I, I, looked, I was like, okay, I know what peace means, but do I know what peace means? It means having a harmonious relationship with God, having a harmonious relationship with another person. Harmony, right? Harmony. Now, I can't say I'm a musician, but I understand there's some notes that work together and there's other notes that don't, right? Anybody like jazz? I don't understand it, right? There's some notes in jazz, they start doing stuff, it's crazy, it's like, it doesn't sound like music to me, right? It doesn't fit, it doesn't come together. But the idea is how do I have this relationship this peace with God. Because the opposite of harmony is having a hostile relationship, having an unfriendly relationship, having a dissonant relationship. Like I know what that looks like. When there's tension and conflict in a relationship, it does not feel good. When there's guilt and when there's frustration and when there's hardship and anger in a relationship, there is not harmony there. And we just got to be true. When we have sin in our lives, we don't have a harmonious relationship with God. When I'm aware of sin in my life and I say, God, I'm keeping it there. I'm not removing it. And he's shining a spotlight and saying, you need to move it. You need to remove it. You need to confess it. You need to repent. You need to turn from it. And I choose to hold on to it and say, but it's my right. Remember, I don't want to be told what to do. Land of the free, home of the brave. God, you don't get to, I'm doing what I want to do. And when you live that way, you don't have harmony with God. It's missing. It's absent. Listen, you can come to this church, and you can sing worship to God all you want, but if you don't have harmony with God, it doesn't fill you up. It it, it doesn't give you joy. It's religious obligation, and you're checking the box. You say, God, I'll give you my voice, but I won't give you my heart. I won't confess the sin. I won't deal with it. And so what it's saying is the peace of Christ, right, having a harmonious relationship with God is when you recognize when God shines a spotlight on something, I confess it. When God shows me a need to change, I change. In my own life this week, I've had to confess sin to God. I've had to confess sin to God. I've had to like, all right, I messed up. I blew it. I didn't do what I knew. I should have. God, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to turn from it. I want to change. I want to be different. And in the confessing step, the repenting step, God and I have that harmonious relationship again. Until you're aware of another sin and another struggle and God forgives and restores and I have that harmonious relationship again. Just like in your house, listen, you know if things are going good between you and the wife. You know if you have a harmonious relationship or if you don't, right? And and most times it's right? I did something I shouldn't have done, or I, I, you know, I did this, or I did, it's like, man, I need to fix that with your kids, right? You know if you have a harmonious relationship with your kids or not, and you know if there's friction there, if there's hardship there, and there's tension there, it's like, I got to speak truth, and sometimes the truth is hard to speak, but you know what? I have to speak truth, and I have to represent, or maybe I have to tell to my kids, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, I was wrong, forgive me, 
And that relationship can be brought back together again. That's the idea when it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The word for rule, it means to be an umpire. And I kind of laugh because we're in the summer season and all the kids are home from school. How long? All summer long. So you're with your kids all summer long. And these kids are at your house all summer long. You're like, when do I get my break? Where's that yellow bus to put the kids on to send them away for eight hours, right? So all summer long, you're being that umpire. You're being that like person who's like, stop, don't, stop, put it back, clean up, pick it up. What did I tell you? Did you do it yet? And you're constantly, constantly in that position. What Paul is saying in this passage, let the peace of Christ be the umpire in your heart. So you come up to a decision, what is the peace-loving thing to do here? You, you come up to a hardship, how can I preserve the peace? You, you come up to a situation and you say, there's disharmony here, what do I need to do to see it come back together? There is hostility here, what do we need to do to push through the hostility? There is unhealth here, what do we need to do to work with the unhealth here? Because when we push towards peace, we become more like Christ. When we let Christ push us towards peace, we're more obedient to Christ. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Oh, and by the way, be thankful. What? Be thankful. Be thankful. Be thankful. That's kind of the way he's finishing this whole passage up. He's like, all right, peace matters. Be thankful. Be thankful. Be thankful. If we can jump to the last quote in your outline, you'll see it there. It's a quote from uh, Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, a, a preacher in the 1800s. And, and he says this, a great sin cannot destroy a Christian, but a little sin can make him miserable. As the worship team comes up, let me just unpack that a little bit. A great sin cannot destroy a Christian. I believe the Bible talks about somebody who is saved, who confesses with their mouth, who believes with their heart. The Holy Spirit is said to be given as a deposit, a guarantee of an inheritance. It's a seal. It's like a tattoo that never comes off. It never goes away. So I think when somebody is saved, what the Bible is trying to say, when they're truly saved, they're truly submissive to God. They truly mean it. They've surrendered their life. They're picking up their cross. They're following Jesus daily. When you're truly saved, listen, you will sin, but it will not destroy that relationship with God. See, no, no sin big enough could ever blow up the relationship that you have with God. But listen to this, Christian, a small sin can make you miserable because you lose the harmony with God. You lose the peace of God. You're moving away from God and God's trying to call you back. And just like in a relationship that's strained and struggling and there's tension and there's hostility in that relationship, it's like, man, God, I'm not doing what you want me to do and I hurt because of that. God, I'm, I'm falling short of what your word says and it makes me sad and I'm carrying this. And, and God, what do I do with it? And God's answer is confess it, repent. Take a step back towards me right? Move towards me, surrender it, confess it, take a step towards me, and God will restore that harmony. God restores that harmony. And so when Spurgeon said, a great sin cannot destroy a Christian, but a little sin can make him miserable, I, I live that. You live that. We live that. In, in a spot, in a place, God's saying, what is that sin, guys? Let's confess it. Let's open it up. Let's be honest with God. Let's be honest with other believers. Let's fight for peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let the peace make the call. It's calling balls and strikes. It's telling you this is in, this is out. This is what you need to do. This is what the Holy Spirit's pushing you towards. That's what brings God the glory. When we obey, surrender, and say, God, you win. I'm following, and I want to see you change who I am. We have one more worship song, and maybe there's something on your heart today that you just need to leave it here at this church. Listen, you can leave this church 10 pounds lighter than you came. Not physically, most likely, but spiritually. You can leave your burdens here. You can leave your anxiety here. You can leave your fear. You can leave your struggle. You can leave your depression. You can say, God, I, I'm tired of carrying it. I want to get my relationship right. I want to have harmony with you again. I want the peace of Christ to rule in my heart. So during this song, you might need to make some, some honest conversation with God. God's where I've been. And God's not surprised. He's seen you. He knows it. He's just been waiting for you to confess it. He's been waiting for you to meet him there, to be honest, to surrender it. So leave those struggles here in this room. Just drop it. Just walk out of here and say, God, I want to experience the forgiveness you offered. I want to have the harmony that you call me to have. I want to do everything with love, and I want to let the peace of Christ rule in my heart. That's what makes the Christian life so attractive because we're living what God calls us to live out. We're doing what God calls us to do.
As we sing this last song, the ushers are going to come forward, the buckets are going, please put your connection cards. If there's something we can pray for you about, or if there's a decision you made or something you're struggling with, write it down in your connection cards, slip it into that bucket, we'll get it. If you came prepared to give, you say, I, I give to God because God's given to me. And if you come prepared to give, you can put their offerings in the, in the bucket that way as well. And connection cards, pens, all that kind of stuff, you can drop it in the bucket. And we are just so excited to see God lead our church to call us to follow him and say, Thrive Church, I want you to make a difference for me today. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that if there's people in this room struggling don't give them rest until they become right with you. And there's people in this room that are wrestling. God, call them to obedience, to harmony with you. Father, there's freedom and joy that comes when we are able to be made right in a relationship with another person or with you. And, and God, that is a perfect gift. It's a wonderful gift that you give. This morning, I pray that people would experience that gift of making their relationships right with you. During this last song, I pray the Holy Spirit would just continue to convict and challenge. God, spotlight the things in our lives that we need to change and, and call us to submit, to surrender, to, to turn away from those things. You have a better way for us, Lord. You want more for us. You want to bless us and give us more than we can ask or imagine. And it comes when we surrender our lives to you daily. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth we get to share this morning. Lord, I pray that this, this room would be full of burdens and struggles and depression and fear and anxiety. People just leave it here and they walk home forgiven with a harmonious relationship with you. Praise you in the powerful name of Jesus.